First, I want to say thank you all for coming. This is a, a great crowd. We're excited to have all of you here. Um, welcome. This is the 16th in our series of Tech Talks here at Indeed. Um, and this time around, we're trying something a little different, as you might have noticed. <laughs> With the panel, we wanted to actually open up this forum to a, a wider group of people to talk a little bit more uh, in particular in Austin um, with a group of companies that are doing stuff that, that um, is interesting and hopefully would be interesting to a larger group. Uh, my name is Chris Hyams. I'm the head of product and international here at Indeed. I've been here for about four years. Um, and really briefly, my, my role, I'm going to moderate here, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction and then these guys are going to do all the talking. Uh, but what we're here for, the name of, the, uh, of today's talk is the reality of mobile software development and what we mean by that is for a long time we've had discussions about the sort of future of software development as mobile and uh, today is the future as far as we're concerned at Indeed. Uh, about three years ago, less than 10% of our searches were from a mobile device. Today it's more than 50%. And the way that we kind of look at our business today is that we're a mobile company that also has a website. And that's a big shift from a company that has been a web company for, for 10 years. And um, so wanted to kind of get a bunch of people together who have different perspectives on this and different experience of how we all got here and, and have a conversation about it. Um, so quick uh, audience participation. First question, how many people here, just raise your hand if your job is to design, build, test, market, et cetera, a mobile site or app? Okay. So. A minority of people. So then for the people who didn't raise your hand, how many of you work somewhere where uh, mobile is important? Maybe it's not your job. Okay. And so how many people work somewhere where mobile is not important at all? Okay. Great. So very briefly, just to kind of go through, and I'll do this in order down the line. So Alex Devine, to my left here, has uh, been a software developer at multiple technology startups here in Austin since 2000. He started working at HomeAway in 2006, originally focusing on back-end services and search functionality. Since March of 2013, he's been an architect for mobile, overseeing software architecture for HomeAway's native iOS and Android applications. To his left is David Rees, uh, serves as principal software engineer at Retail Me Not, primarily responsible for building highly scalable API infrastructure and content delivery systems to support Retail Me Not's iPhone, iPad, and Android applications. Over the last 20 years, David has worked on dozens of web apps, mobile apps, and games across PC, console, and iOS platforms. Uh, to his left, John M. P. Knox is a senior iOS developer at Evernote, where he helps build Skitch and Evernote. He's been developing apps since 2008, and before that, developed tools for the semiconductor industry. When he's not at work, you'll find him making photographs and windsurfing. And finally, on the end, J. Christopher Garcia is the user experience director here at Indeed. Chris helped launch Indeed's mobile website and was the sole iOS developer at Indeed for many years. He continues to work on mobile job search, A-B testing new features, and improvements. First of all, thank you guys all for coming here today. And um, I will kick things off by just asking each of you briefly to uh, give a little bit of the context of mobile at your company. So if you could just talk briefly, maybe for a couple of minutes, about both the history of mobile um, at your company and the current state, what platforms you support, and, um, and in particular, what area you're focused on. Okay. Um, so for HomeAway, uh, for, if you're not familiar, HomeAway was founded in 2004. And like Chris said, again, we all came from a web background. Uh, our first mobile website, I believe, was either late 2009 or early 2010. And then our first uh, iPhone app was in, released in 2010. That app was actually outsourced to a third-party company. Um, we brought that in-house in 2011, uh, where we had, it was pretty much the same thing. We had one iPhone developer for a couple years. Um, and then it was really in the beginning of 2012 where we put a huge uh, investment into into mobile, grew the team a lot, um, brought you know both iPhone and Android development in house, um, and since that time has basically exploded, um, like most people I'm sure everyone's aware of. So um, yeah, it it definitely has been a big big shift for us from you know more of like a side project to something that's just crucial to the way HomeAway works. 
Um, similar story for Retail Me Not, I think, you know, started um, as a website and a web-based product that um, Whale Shark actually acquired and um, basically put um, good business investment in the web product and grew it very well. Um, saw mobile as a growing force, but didn't exactly know how to take it on. Um, I joined around 2012, and that's actually right about the time they started looking at building out their mobile platform. So the first stab for Retail Me Not at mobile was essentially to recreate the website experience, but on a, you know, iPhone. That worked pretty well. We had some good downloads and some good success, but it um, didn't exactly bring anything new to the table as far as the capabilities of the device were not exploited. So um, the company kind of continued down that track for a little while um, and you know, added the Android platform a bit later and then sort of made a fundamental shift towards actually trying to exploit the device, um, invested more heavily in mobile, brought on more resources, and um, try to develop some mobile application products. Um, and when I say mobile, I'm talking specifically of the native app. There was always a mobile website that um, sort of was a sister product to the core website. Um, we added geofencing and location into the product and you know, realized that we struck a chord with a bunch of our users and our um, you know, user base really exploded at that point and we felt like we were you know, kind of onto something. So um, you know, we're still sort of in that mindset trying to balance what um, you know, smart investments to make that make sense for that kind of device um, and uh, still trying to figure it out. So at, at Evernote, uh, we started out originally basically being an app for the web and for the desktop, and uh, mobile really came to play, I guess, uh, when uh, the public SDK for iOS first was uh, released by Apple. Uh, somewhat before that, we'd been working on uh, an iOS, uh, an iPhone app to kind of complement the Mac app, and uh, Evernote uh, somehow managed to show it to somebody who worked at Apple, and they thought it was really cool. And uh, so they kind of featured it in the App Store on the, like day zero of uh, the App Store. And uh, it drove tremendous growth to the Evernote platform. Um, basically, uh, ever since then, like being on every platform, mobile platform natively, has been kind of part of the, the Evernote growth strategy. Um, we've been featured on many different App Stores, Android. Uh, we even have uh, apps for Windows Phone. We have a traditional Windows app. We have uh, I guess it's Windows 8. I don't know what we call that anymore. It used to be Metro, the, the operating system formerly known as Metro. Uh, we have apps there. Um, <laughs> so we, and we have, of course, all the web app, and uh, we improve all these uh, over time. We have apps for Glass, Google Glass, for the Pebble, uh, pretty much everywhere. And um, you know, we try to make our apps to basically fit each of these platforms as best we can do it. We adopt the technologies from each of these individual platforms uh, to try to make it the you know, a very distinguishable app on those platforms, something that tries to utilize all of the features that they have. And uh, because of that, we get featured a lot, and that helps drive a lot of users to our platform. Um, so as, as Chris Himes had already mentioned, um, mobile's really big here at Indeed. Over half of all the searches that are done are done from a mobile device. So uh, mobile's a really big part of our business. Um, we are actually one of the uh, most popular free business apps um, for iOS and Android. And we've managed to do that using our really small engineering team. You know, Going back to how we got started in mobile, first it was just a mobile website. And uh, we were doing that for a while. And I actually became the uh, iOS developer because I had a Mac. And <laughs> Ronnie, the co-founder, came over and said, well, you've got a Mac, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you work on this iOS app? Like, I'm sure you can just put it in the store. And I said, well, I, that, I don't really know if it works that way. I've never written Objective-C or C, and I don't really write software. I'm the designer, and I'm trying to do these other things. And he's, he, was, he was very confident in my abilities. And you know, we you know, kind of muddled through it, and we ended up getting something in the App Store. And you know, that, that small little idea of an app has you know, turned into a really huge part of our business. So I think uh, you know, every day, 
more than 200,000 people submit um, mobile applications uh, using our mobile product. So uh, it's, it's really important at Indeed. And again, because of engineering decisions and design decisions we've made, we're able to, uh, to be uh, really effective on the mobile platform using a really small number of engineers. So I have a, a couple of different topics that I want to cover. And um, what I'll do just to keep things interesting is start each one off with a different person. Um, and then uh, but everyone can kind of chime in. So I think for the, um, for the next one, let's actually start with, uh, with Chris, because I think that um, this is an area where Indeed is actually very different from Evernote. Maybe we can come down the line this way. Um, so in, from a perspective of thinking about the product, and in particular, where you have these multiple different platforms. So there's this one perspective, which is that mobile is just one of many different platforms. So there is some notion of wanting to have consistency of user experience, consistency of design across those platforms. Um, at the same time, mobile is a fundamentally different experience because it's this thing. It's not just a smaller version of your website. It's this thing that you carry around in your pocket and you live and experience with differently. So if you guys want to just address uh, you know, as broadly as you like, um, and feel free to ask questions of each other here. Um, how is the mobile product different than the desktop, and, and, and how do you think about that? You know, I, I think the mobile product is, is just fundamentally different from desktop in that it's, it's so personal. Um, people, multiple people will often share a computer, but it's really rare that you would share your phone. Your phone is your phone, and it's, it's yours. And, and having that context of, knowing that when someone's interacting with your service, they're the only ones who are interacting with it from that device. It opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, just uh, design-wise, you know, there's different opportunities on mobile. When we, when we think about mobile, there's, there's mobile web and there's mobile apps. And each one of those actually lends different things. Um, knowing that a, a person launched their app I think it fundamentally means something different than if they browse through their website. We find that a lot of our mobile users uh, who are using our mobile apps are more engaged than our web users. Uh, you know, they made a conscious decision to go to the app store, to download your app, to, to tap on the icon. And uh, we feel that, that it leads to different behaviors and it leads to different opportunities. So um, yeah, the, the, the person, because the device is so personal, it leads to a lot of a lot of opportunities that make it really hard to do on desktop. Uh, so I guess I'm supposed to respond to this. <laughs> um, let's see uh, what to say. Uh, yeah, basically, um, for Evernote, like the reason mobile is important to us is because we want it to be the information that you put into Evernote. You own it. We want you to have the ability to access it no matter where you are no matter what device you have. And um, at the same time, we also want to be able to use the, the technology a mobile phone has to kind of enhance your data. If, you, if I were to take a note right now in Evernote for my iOS app, it would geotag it, and it would also automatically title the note with the name of this event, uh, which is helpful. And uh, so there's also additional data you can get from your mobile device uh, that makes it uh, um, more useful, more handy, quicker way to, to, to get your data and to record data. Um, but how different are the usage patterns? Like when you look at data that's entered into Evernote via the app versus what someone is going to use via the web or via a native Mac app. Like I use Evernote, I type long form notes in a meeting in the Mac app. I'm not typing long form notes on the mobile app, but I'm taking pictures and tagging them on the phone. So I mean, how, how differently do you guys think about what the experience is? We, we basically look at every platform individually. Uh, just about every platform has its own team of designers and developers. There's some sharing going on, but we look at each platform kind of with fresh eyes, or at least we try to. Um, and so the usage patterns are very different. You see a lot of people taking photos uh, with their mobile devices and uh, taking photos of documents um, and like business cards, for instance, in their Evernote apps. Um, because it's, you know, it's a very handy way to get data into Evernote uh, quickly. And of course, we OCR and everything. So we see people putting a lot more photographs, for sure, into, into um, Evernote on, on mobile. Uh, people take quick notes. And there are also crazy people who attach keyboards to their phones or to their iPads and take lots of notes or all their notes on, uh, on those devices. I've heard that, like, uh, for instance, iPads are very popular in studios because it doesn't make any sounds when you're typing. And so you can just have you know, all these managers sitting around while you're doing you know, acting or something and just 
typing away furiously at their email and not paying attention to what's going on. Um, and nobody knows because it's a silent keyboard and it's great. Um, so I don't know, does that answer the question? We, we, like, we think that each platform kind of has unique capabilities and that's why we do the native apps for just about everything. Um, I don't think I have any counterpoints to that. Uh, I, I tend to agree with the notion that it's a very personal device. Um, I mean, you have the sum of human knowledge in your pocket, and if you choose to exercise your option to pull out the device and open up our app, it's a very conscious decision, and we want to maximize that opportunity. Um, and with at least the, you know, the space that we're in, um, people who are walking around and shopping, um, we can provide some real value there that um, you know, the, the website product cannot, and, um, you know, even to some extent, the mobile web product can't. Um, you know, we know a lot more about you and can, you know, help, you know, save you money, which is technically our goal. So if you're at a store and we can provide you some content that's very valuable, um, we want to do that. And that's caused us to, you know, diverge the design from its original incarnation as a website built on Objective-C, which is essentially how it started. And that's changed the kind of back-end products that we've had to develop as well. We really had to focus our energy on building out, um, you know, an in-store offering um, for, you know, taking advantage of the location information, which is something that the desktop site would have never driven. So, um, you know, personally, um, I think I see you know, each sort of platform and the use cases for them and the applications for them having vastly different, you know, UIs and functionalities as suited towards the, toward the use case. Um, I don't, you know, certainly the branding should s speak to you about what kind of, um, whose product you're using, but I pass that, I'm not sure I buy this notion of um, you know, consistent sort of experience from a functionality standpoint. Yeah, I think the, the only thing I w really wanted to add was from HomeWay's perspective, it's definitely the case where you want to look at each platform as what people are going to do on it. So for example, a tablet is great for people who are just browsing for vacation rental. You have really big pictures. Um, but from the mobile perspective, I would say don't underestimate what people expect to do on the phone now. So you were saying like, oh, I wouldn't like, you know, type out a long email on a phone. Like I was like, dude, you need a swipe keyboard. That's why. Like there's definitely, like people do tons of stuff. And so for HomeAway, a lot of the owner functionality is, that's currently in the app is focused around like responding really quickly to an incoming uh, reservation request or an incoming inquiry. And so that was the, the main use case that we really wanted to focus on, make it super easy. Uh, the responsiveness time, uh, like the time that it takes from someone to submit uh, a booking request till when they actually get a response is super important for customer sat. So that use case was really important. But now we have owners who are like, well, I basically want to manage tons of stuff about my listing on the phone. Whereas originally we're thinking, oh, those people are going to, you know, go to the PC or, or go to something where it's a little easier. You have bigger screen real estate. You've got a keyboard. But, I mean, people do so much on their phones now that I, I guess I would just say don't underestimate what people expect to be able to do on a mobile device. One, and I guess one question as a result of that, and we don't have to have everyone answer, but if anyone has an answer, one of the things that we've definitely seen is that uh, given the incredible majority of email that is open today on a mobile device, one of the things that we've noticed, you mentioned sort of taking quick action, that emails that have links that when they get clicked need to be able to go somewhere where someone can actually take that action. And uh, so I guess, the, is, have any of you guys have deep linking into the app directly from emails or how do you handle mobile clicks on, on emails? I'll just answer first because we just fixed that bug <laughs> in the sense that yeah, we all, we, the link from the email goes to a website that then, you know, uses some JavaScript to detect, do you already have the app installed? If it does, it will deep link into the app. Otherwise, it will either go to a responsive version of the site or go to a, um, uh, show you a link to download the app. But in that one, the devil is definitely in the details. We had some, an issue where it was broken on, like, one version of iOS only, but not the latest version. So. 
but definitely, yeah, in terms of getting people deep linked into, you know, responding directly to the inquiry or make it easy for them to download the app is really important for us. David, is that something you guys deal with? Um, so we've definitely done some, you know, experimentation with that, but I wouldn't say it's something that we've um, made um, a lot of utilization of. Um, certainly, um, when you get notifications and um, open up um, offers, if we can detect that you have the app installed, we'll definitely open that. I think otherwise we go to responsive design. But um, you know, uh, to Alex's point, the uh, the state of each platform, I'm less uh, less aware of specifically. Chris. So uh, since our, our mobile and our app experiences are so similar, it, it hasn't been a, a super big driving force for us to make sure that you're opening in the app. Uh, we do on Android, I think, open in the app, just because that's the way the app is set up. On iOS, I think we've, we've tried opening in the app, and we didn't really see that it was uh, that much more positive to bring them into the app than rather just leave them on the web. So since our, our functionality is uh, pretty much on par. It hasn't really been that big of an issue for us, but we do have a lot of people coming from emails, and uh, you know they just expect to be able to accomplish whatever they need to accomplish. So I don't know that they they, they care as long as they are able to do what they wanted to do. Great. Well, we can uh, jump to the next topic, and um, I guess I'll start this one off with David. Um, so some of that was the kind of product and design considerations. Uh, engineering is obviously another big thing, and I think most of the folks here come from the engineering side. So um, in particular, you know, how do you, you know, John had one very clear sort of directive from his company in terms of it's all native everywhere, essentially to as far as they can possibly go. How have you guys approached the native versus, um, versus web, uh, focusing on the different platforms? And then also, are there any particular engineering challenges around performance or around testing or things like that? But just forced you guys to think about this is completely different than the way that you had done um, engineering before? Yeah, so to the, fir the first part of the question, um, we definitely approach um, the mobile website separate from the native app. And um, right from the start, um, wanted the, the native app to you know be built on the platform. So um, there was a brief period of time, I think, right when I started or before I got there where they, you know, built a, you know, um, what we call our M dot site for, you know, handling, um, you know, web requests coming from the mobile device. And in fact, you know, that part of the business is, you know, ever growing consistently. So um, I do expect to see um, more, you know, changes in that particular, um, in that particular technology stack. But um, from a design, development standpoint, you know, the stacks are completely separated. The, the, you know, Android development and the iOS and the iPad are all different, um, you know, specifically different applications. There is some shared code, obviously, between iOS um, platform devices. And then on the back end, the um, tech stack is completely isolated from the website, um, both MDOT and desktop. And, um, you know, I guess from a, what I guess I found a little surprising is it was the first time I really had to work with scale um, and um, so scale and bringing so much content from so many different places down to the device very quickly. You know, responsiveness is huge. Um, you open it up and, you know, you stare at a spinner. You're in a store with bad connectivity. You know, you definitely don't want to be sending down a huge payload or have you know, 30, 40 second, you know, delivery times, things like that. So, you know, we certainly invested very, very heavily in making sure that the payloads are the right size and we built the topology of the endpoints very closely with the native app developers to um, make sure that, you know, the content that they're trying to display is there. And then the native app developers put a lot of effort into ensuring that, you know, if there is a non-optimal network experience going on, the app still seems to perform pretty well. So, you know, in the cases where the connectivity is bad, you might not even notice um, that, you know, there's a problem. So um, it's certainly um, been challenging. And I guess with our space, the 
other big thing that uh, I found pretty both you know scary and exhilarating was a holiday shopping. You know, we get massive bursts of traffic once the holidays come, and you know, you, know, you don't want to get the phone call from you know your boss if you're not serving content and. Um, I worked very hard not to get that phone call, and you know the other side of it is I like to sleep, so I tried to build the things so that I get asleep. And um, you know that's not something that you know all parts of the company always have to worry about, but you know we're definitely very sensitive to that because we view, view the users as a precious resource, and it doesn't take much for a user to have a bad experience and decide that they're going to look elsewhere. And we definitely are sensitive to that. Yeah, I guess the one thing that, that stuck in my mind was when you were talking about the engineering challenges, I think definitely some of our biggest challenges have, make, have been making sure that the business logic between the web side of things and the native side of things stay in sync. And so one was just making sure that all of our services could be easily accessed by uh, both the native app and by the website. But even then, it's a balance because a lot of times you do need to have you know, some amount of business rules in your client if you want to have a responsive UI. And so actually, one of our server devs is in the audience, and he, he sent out this message on HipChat. He was like, dude, it's like 2,000 lines of JavaScript that, you know, that we had some business logic, business logic in on the, the um, website of things. And there, there was a couple places, places in there where like, oh, you know, crap, we need to make sure that that logic is that we are, are following those same business rules on the native side of things. So I guess my recommendation there, and which we're, we're, we've been making a push towards and that we're doing more is pushing as much as possible, like everything that you can think of up to the server. Because you know if you have to duplicate it, there's a good chance that you're going to get it wrong at some point, whether it's a bug fix in one platform and not in the other. So we've been making a real, real strong push to, to get things up to the server we still have a, a way where we can do some differentiation between uh, between you know calls that come from the native app and calls that come from the website, um, but that that's definitely I think been a real big challenge. And so to think about how you you know on on one sense you want things to be the same, but you know some cases you have a reason to have some differentiation. Um, it, it's that maintaining that balance has been hard for us. So, so John, in particular, you guys not only have different platforms. I actually looked at the Wikipedia page for Evernote, and like just counting the number of platforms was dizzying. But as you mentioned, Glass, Pebble, I mean, you have all these different things that are not even just different platforms. They're just a completely different you know, user experience. So how do, how do you approach that stuff? Well, like, like I said, we tend to have different teams look at the different platforms. And uh, so the designers and the people, uh, the developers and the product managers working on that will kind of, they'll basically look at um, the, the platform um, and try to figure out what the unique pieces are. They want to build something for each platform that's going to blend in with you know, the, the rest of the native ecosystem, but also you know, have the kind of the Evernote characteristics as well. So it's kind of this balancing act where you want people to be familiar um, from both sides. You know, they want it to be a familiar Evernote experience. They want it to be a familiar like Android or iOS or Windows experience. Um, but they also want it to be distinct and uh, you know look really sharp. Uh, you know, um, but you know because we have this kind of platform strategy, we you know we intentionally try to pick the new stuff that's coming out on each platform. And if we can figure out a way to use that in our app. That's like one of the ways you can get featured in the app store is that you kind of adopt all the new, the look and feel of the platform, like iOS 7, for instance, that was a big push to get a lot of the UI redesigned in the iOS app and uh, adopt new features, you know, the parallax and the more transparent look to it and all these different technologies that they introduced and uh, take advantage of that. And another thing was like the smart covers, you know, Evernote Peak. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where you could uh, kind of have the flashcard where you'd You'd open up your smart cover just a little bit, and you could see the question. You try to remember it, and then you open it a little bit more. You can see the answer, and then you can kind of register got it right or wrong. That stuff like that, like you know, really gets the interest of the apps. Are like, oh wow, here's like they're taking advantage of this feature of the product. We didn't even know that you could take advantage of and try to you know. So we get creative with that, and uh, you know, oftentimes it works out in our favor. And uh, you know, people want to take advantage of all the features of the phone. There's a reason why you spend. $700 on a telephone, you know, that you put in your pocket. It's not to make phone calls. You want to use the GPS and you want to use the accelerometer and uh, 
the beautiful retina display and that, that camera that you know takes 42 megapixels or whatever that crazy Nokia phone is, and they, they want all that stuff. Um, so we try to try to use it as best as we can. You know, actually, kind of going to what Alex was saying. You know, uh, we, we've managed to be able to, to leverage a lot of a lot of our code across uh, our web and apps. So we, uh, we we've kind of been lucky in, in that we don't have that a lot of duplication, but because of the way that the uh, initial stuff was all set up, um, the stuff that we do for web is actually distinct from what we do for mobile. So we do actually run into this problem where it's like we figure something out on web, but then we have to go do that same thing on, on mobile. And for and clarity, when you say web, you mean desktop? I mean, I mean desktop, web. desktop web. So when we, when we figure something out for desktop, for the web, website on desktop, uh, we have to go and redo that thing again for mobile, and it's you just really want to reduce the amount of duplication that you have to do at all. It, it, it's a pain to, to do something and then have to do it twice. It just introduces not only the, that much more time, but you know it's just prone to errors, and so now you're just introducing this other place where you might have a bug, or you might do it wrong, or something might fail, and here's one more system that might go down, and you're gonna have to figure out why. So yeah, it, you know, as much as we try to, to not duplicate code, there still are instances where we duplicate it, and we just try to reduce that that um, duplication down to the smallest parts, and really try to keep the uh, UI layers as thin as possible. Uh, just a quick counterpoint on that. Yeah, we do have, obviously, like for each platform, it's completely different code doing a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but really, the you know what it all boils down to is the data that we store on our servers. Um, so that's kind of the unifying force for for everything. Is like you know, no matter what you do on the phone, we still have to find a way to get that data and the metadata down to the server and stored there and synchronized across all your devices. Um, so I think that helps a little bit. Like it makes it so that we don't, you know, if somebody introduces a new feature on on Android, like uh, we have an ink feature in Android now, where we can. You can actually like draw with your finger or a stylus into a note. Uh, we don't have that on iOS. We don't have an equivalent feature. Um, but because we have to get it down into the cloud, we basically, you know, they're still viewable on iOS. Um, they render as images. You can't edit them, but um, it, it all boils down to data in the same place, and it's viewable across all the devices. And, and so that, that helps. Um, the, Interesting thing is always when something really takes off. Uh, some we tried an idea in Android like Ink, maybe that'll really take off, and then all of a sudden I see I have to, you know, write a new feature in the iOS app that uses that uses Ink, and I have to learn how to, how that works. And uh, but that's you know it's kind of fun, and it's kind of a way to experiment with features, right? Try it on one platform and see see what the performance is, and then decide if you want to invest in the other platforms. Great. Um, I'll just throw out one more question, and then what I want to do is open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have questions, think about them, and then uh, we'll pass around the mics, and feel free to ask questions of anyone. Um, one thing, and we had gotten together a, a couple times before this to talk about things, and one of the, the things that came up was, um, were all companies that started out not focused on mobile and then have had to sort of make that transition? And and so the question is, for for you guys, what was the sort of either the biggest kind of aha moment in that in that shift in terms of, oh, this is something that works or something that doesn't work, or, or you know, what was the biggest, you know, terrible mistake that you made that uh, you then had to go and undo? So it's something that was, that was surprising that if you had known when you started, it would have been helpful. Again, you know, uh, Ronnie had come up to me and said, hey, I want you to build this iOS app and everything. And, and again, the, the idea of this kind of lean startup principle and all that kind of stuff is like, let, let's just put the web in an app. It's just basically going to be the website. And why don't you put that in the app store and see if anybody downloads it? And you know, the designer part of me was kind of reluctant to do that. I was like, wow, that doesn't really seem like that's going to be that great of an experience. Like we can do all these things on the device. Like We should really be working with these transitions and animations and really creating this uh, awesome experience. And you know, it seems like it's going to be kind of lame just to put mostly uh, web content up on this app. And you know, after just kind of going around and around, we you know finally decided, okay, let's just do it, let's try it. Because if nobody downloads the app, there's really no point in investing the resources to to do it native. And, and over time, you know, I've, I found that that was actually a really good decision, and we've we've benefited a lot uh, engineering-wise. Uh, but but that initial reluctance of having this preconceived notion of I don't think this is going to be a good experience, and it's not going to be good enough, and so I don't want to do it. And being able to kind of work through that and see that, you know, uh, my my personal, 
my, my personal outlook and my, my personal views on what's acceptable and what's necessary or necessarily what um, our, our users have. They have, they have different values and, and it's really when I, when I align my values to theirs and when we as a company align our values to theirs and trying to really focus on getting them uh, the jobs, you know, we help people get jobs and as long as we're always focused on, on doing that, a lot of the other stuff is, is secondary or even tertiary. And um, so that was really eye-opening to me again, is just, is just thinking about like, as a designer, I might be reluctant to do something, but I try to be open enough to the experience and try to think of all of the benefits that uh, could be gained by trying stuff a different way. Yeah, I would say uh, one recommendation, especially coming from the web side of things, where you're really used to just being able to you know, put out a release like that, and you don't have that luxury, in the, at least in the native mobile wor world, is to, from your very first version, make sure that you have some way where you can pop up like an app alert from your server. Um, either say, hey, like you need to download a later version because you're on a really old version. Uh, we had a bug just uh, a couple weeks ago where um, unfortunately it slipped through QA because it was a path that, um, it was the, the problem was is that we weren't remembering uh, owner logins and it went through QA because if you actually went to a different part of the app, you didn't see that bug and then it was forever saved. But, um, so I, I, if you want to find out a great way to get tons of one-star reviews, let your users, make your users log in every time uh, they get the app. So, so that was not fun. Um, but, but so we found it out in like th that same day, we had a fix out, you know, and it was, it was out. Um, and again, we had to go through the app store, uh, you know, approval process, which really sucks. Like I really hate the app store approval process. It's, it's just way easier on Android. But, but if we had some way to just message to the user like, Hey, there's actually this, you know, one-click workaround that you can get it, so it will that it will save your credentials. You know, it, it would have, you know, taken a lot of pain uh, off off of us. So it, I would definitely, and it's one of these things that, like, you hit it the first time, and you're like, oh yeah, we should make sure we have that functionality. But if, if you build it in from the very first version, then you, even people that are back uh, on older versions, we had another case where we actually we had an iPad, a native iPad app at one point we decided that we'd actually rather use the responsive UI in our website to, to uh, focus that for, uh, for tablet users. And then we discovered that Apple apps won't, will not let you take an, a, a tablet app, the iPad app, out of your binary. So we're like, oh, you know, we were really scared of, so basically we had to, we had to open it up under an entire new uh, app ID. And so, and we didn't have a, a real easy way um, to, to message all the people that had the app, hey, you know, you need to download uh, this other app. So, so that, that was really painful. Um, but just to have that functionality, and again, if you're coming from the web world, you're so used to just being able to, to put out a release like that, um, uh, you know, backwards compatibility is, is definitely something you need to, to plan for in the native world. Um, so I think our aha moment was definitely uh, geofencing and location services. Um, that definitely, you know, got the company excited about the mobile application in a way that um, you know hadn't been done before. Uh, it also sort of opened up the imagination to a bunch of other things that we could be doing. And so we started doing some of those. Uh, Passbook comes to mind as after a great aha moment, we were, oh, this Passbook thing's coming out. We went to the conference, we're all excited, you know, put a bunch of engineering effort into, you know, making the data flows work all the way in the back end down to the app and getting, you know, the proper uh, systems in place for operations people to deal with it. And then at the last minute, you know, weren't able to actually use it. And, you know, it's still probably sitting there, you know, in various attributes on a bunch of database tables and sent down to the client empty most of the time and not being used. So, you know, that's definitely kind of frustrating. Um, it would have been nice to, you know, figure that out ahead of time. Um, so that's, I would call that sort of a failure in our product design a little bit, but, you know, also that's going to happen, I think. So um, it, it, small morale kick, but it wasn't too bad. Um, I'd say uh, one of the biggest technical challenges we've had, um, you know, is the version craziness, especially when we're dealing with our um, data model migrations between app versions. Um, you know, between iPhone versions, and, and I'll pick on iPhone here because I don't know, I think Android had similar problems, but I don't know them as well. Um, between the 
iOS version, the app version, and the jump you're making when you're doing the download. You know, sometimes something goes wrong, and you know, I guess if you're lucky, they just lose their data. If you're unlucky, the app crashes all the time, and that really blows. Um, you know, so the please download the app is definitely a, a good thing to be able to bring up um, to you know deal with that and. Begging Apple to rush your app um, approval is also something that uh, you might have to do. Um, I think the only other challenge we've really had from a um, technical standpoint and, you know, oops, is um, when we were first integrating our geo notifications on the client app, um, we, you know, we have a bunch of analytics and reporting in there and, you know, all of a sudden we get all these signals about our apps being used, you know, by an order of magnitude different across, you know, the week of an app release. And, you know, obviously something's wrong. It takes, you know, many, many hours of painful debugging and um, with Wireshark and whatever else was going on for them to figure out that every time, you know, um, some no notification happened, it triggered some API call that um, inside the app that, sent this signal to the server that indicated the user was using the app when they weren't. And so, you know, those kinds of things are very, very frustrating because you look at that API call and it's, you know, hey, I'm reading some code. I don't need to, like, grab that data from somewhere else. I've got this one thing that'll do it. But, you know, oh, that thing also reports that the users are interacting with the app when they actually might not be. Well, I think I already mentioned probably the like historical biggest aha moment was, you know, getting featured in the, you know, original app store. Um, but uh, I guess along those lines, more recently, uh, one of the bigger uh, wake-up moments, I think, for Evernote was uh, last year's security breach. And you can read about that online. A lot of the information um, were, were basically the uh, hashes, of password hashes were stolen, not the passwords themselves. And uh, we made the decision basically to basically disable everybody's passwords and make them create new passwords. And uh, I think you know, we basically pushed a new version of every single app to every single app store in, you know, I don't remember how many days, it was like two or three days, or it was a very long weekend. I don't remember how many days were in that weekend, it was long. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that was, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it was an interesting experience and it made us kind of realize just how important it is to kind of be prepared for these kind of events, like they're saying, being able to send messaging to your users through the app is a very useful thing to do. Uh, if you don't have that, looking at something like Urban Airship uh, might be very helpful because uh, you can do all sorts of interesting things with that to message your users if you don't want to build the infrastructure yourself. Um, but yeah, being prepared for these kind of uh, eventualities, like no matter who you are, if you know if you're big enough, somebody's going to try to you know they're going to find a way to get some sort of exploit against you, and you have to be kind of prepared for that moment. And uh, so we've built up, you know, a security team and uh, built up a, a lot more infrastructure to kind of deal with this in case, you know, something goes wrong again in the future. Hopefully it won't because we have a great security team. Um, but uh, it's important to be able to kind of respond in an emergency like this. Great. Well, so let's uh, open things up now. Um, looks like we've got, so I don't even have to prompt anything. we got a question right there. Um, so I've been hearing a lot of Apple Retina and I know all of your teams are small. It just sounds like we're pushing Android off to the side. Maybe between less engagement with the users, fragmentation. Is that the reality with your engineering teams, is that you're spending more resources significantly more on the Apple side of things than your other platforms? Or is that just what I'm hearing? Well, I happen to be you know, doing iOS development work at Evernote. Um, we do have a large Android team, and we have a lot of users on Android. Um, I have been an Android developer in the past, and um, you know, I, I can tell you it's a platform that we have a lot of interest in because we get a lot of users from it. And we, you know, like I was saying, we have the ink feature on Android only, I believe, at this point. Um, so you know, we don't neglect our, our other platforms as long as it looks like they're you know growing platforms. Uh, if you're, you know. Uh, some old like Nokia Symbian or something like that. We're probably not going to like write some fancy app for you, but for growing real growing platforms, yeah. Yeah, I, I think we we spend the same amount of time on Android as on iOS. 
Uh, they're, they're both the same. Again, we try to keep all, all the features the same or try to create a consistent experience across all platforms. So we're spending about the same amount of time, or at least the same amount of effort, I'd, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I just happen to be a you know Mac user and uh, initially an iOS developer, so I probably uh, lean that way when I speak. And I think the company did initially, you know, just because we didn't want to start up both platforms at the same time. But after we kind of got our legs under us, and got the investment up in the Android platform and got some parity between the two, we worked pretty hard to you know, keep it that way. I won't say it doesn't swing a little iOS-y now and again, but um, you know, for the most part, I think we do a much better job now. Yeah, I mean, for us, we have two native Android developers, two native iOS developers. Um, I think we, we all probably started with, with iOS just because it was first, um, but they're definitely, we see them as, as equal platforms. Again, Android is growing, you know, worldwide growing much faster than iOS, so it's, it's huge for us. Hi, right, thanks. Um, my question is, is uh, more along the lines of, uh, you know, it sounds like you guys are, e each one of these company, companies on the panels are, are focusing on iOS versus Android at some point or another. Uh, I guess lately there's been a push towards developing hybrid mobile, mobile solutions using PhoneGap or Cordova, you know, MeanStack or, or JavaScript, uh, I kind of favor that. But, you know, two questions. Is there a reason why you're not doing that now? And if you were, if you had the opportunity to do it all over again, would you uh, build a hybrid solution rather than, than have a, two iOS developers and two Android developers? Thanks. Uh, well, for our home, we, uh, now we actually are using some PhoneGap stuff. So we acquired a company called Glad to Have You in April, and their app was all uh, in PhoneGap, and so we were actually really lucky that it was because we were able to actually embed the section for what we call the hospitality portion of the app, which we reskinned it, um, and it's a it's a HTML5 PhoneGap section of the app, and th that's actually from a, our aha moment. I mean, I'm really proud that we were able to get that out super quickly, um, and it it, fe it it doesn't feel jarring in the sense that it doesn't try to you know um, replicate native control so it, it has its own separate UI but it, it feels nice in the app but in terms of the the balance between native and um, and whether you're going to do something that's cross-platform for us the biggest driving factor originally was the idea that if someone um, just has to pick your app out of the app store like there's nothing that's really kind of you know forcing them to do so we felt that native was important because you can really get to all of the nitty gritty of the platform. I mean, John, I think speaks a lot to this, to like, hey, you can flip stuff up. Uh, for one, we have a, a separate app for, um, for our, it's targeted towards our property managers to their employees, okay? Now that's something that's like, the property manager is gonna tell you, you have to use this app, okay? So no, we're not, and that is a case where that was a phone gap app and we got a lot of leverage being able to do that. So I would say, it, it's a, it's a tough call, more so now because the the website of thing, the phone gap side of things has has I think advanced a lot more than it was. But still, I mean, there's still definitely a lot of benefit um, that you can do in the UI that I just think is is you know you, you might hit that point where you're like oh we have this like jet you know a little bit of jitteriness on Android especially at the moment for some of our HTML5 stuff so. If you're really, really concerned about super smooth, you know, like super slickness, we go to native. Um, but if you, you if you can take more, like, hey, we need to get more productivity out of it, and as long as it's it's you know it looks nice, but you, you can you can take a little more off the the, the fit and finish, then um, I think a lot of the cross platform stuff works great. So I don't want to be a broken record on this uh, native versus non native. Uh, stuff. Um, obviously, we do a lot of native stuff, but we do, there are parts of our apps that are basically web views, and that allows us to, to you know, uh, reuse some, some code, some JavaScript code, or um, for instance, like our, the Everett Market, I believe, is, uh, is a web view, and I think the content's pretty much the same for uh, Android and iOS, the market. If you're not familiar with it, it's a, basically a curated physical store. You can buy, um, like, bags and uh, Moleskin notebooks and that that sort of stuff, and and there's no reason that shouldn't just be you know basically a nice looking web view, um, because it doesn't have to be high performance. It's a catalog, right? You're looking at it, it just has to be look nice. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, we do native stuff. Uh, that said, you know, there are some beautiful apps out there that, that are based on things like PhoneGap, and they're awesome, and you wouldn't be able to tell that they're non-native. That said, if you're doing stuff that has lots of animation and you want to use cutting edge features of the platform where we have large amounts of data to process, um, things like technologies like JavaScript are, are, you know, they might hold you back and it might be more difficult to figure out how to, how to do things, if, especially like processing large amounts of data, like you're going to run out of, uh, you know, the amount of memory you can possibly allocate to like a web view, for instance. Uh, if you have these huge DOMs, it'll be very difficult to, to, to debug potentially. Um, so you can do it, uh, but you know, buyer beware. Yeah, and again, it, it probably depends on where you are in your business too. Uh, you know, um, if, if the choice is I've got to hire four engineers and it's going to cost so much money, and I'm not actually going to be able to do that, or or how much is that going to really cost me? Does that put me in a bad position? Or I can put something in the store and see if it works. If the choice is being in the store or not being in the store, then you should probably just use PhoneGap and do it, and hopefully that's successful, and hopefully you'll find out what, exactly why it's successful, and you'd be able to uh, leverage your success into getting engineering talent when you need it, and you can convert things and make it even better. Um, but I don't, I don't think like you, you have to start off with engineers necessarily. Again, it, it really depends on, on where you are in a business and what kind of product you're actually going to field, too. Trying to do a, uh, uh, maybe a, a really intense game in PhoneGap may not work out so well, or reading files from the network, or media playing apps, like those might not really be well suited. So it depends, it depends on your particular circumstance. But I think all these tools are great. I, I think it's great that we have a range, and we can mix and match them, and it doesn't have to be either or. We can use them to uh, whenever they advantage us the most. For a lot of people, they think that this is like, um in terms of getting into an, an app store that you know going one way versus the other is going to save them money and i don't think that's necessarily true because i think you know being able to write a native app for ios is kind of that's you know not a super common skill say but being able to write uh, html and javascript app for an iphone is also a rare skill and maybe even more rare than just writing a, a native iphone app uh, so I don't know if it's true that that's going to be cheap or not, and you have to think about that. And you should think also, why do you want to be in the App Store? Is it really part of your strategy, or is it kind of a vanity thing? Because uh, apps are not cheap to build, maintain, and once you get it in there, you know the expectation is kind of that you're going to keep going with it if you're kind of your company's an ongoing business, right? So you're committing to this kind of ongoing support, and oops. You know, iOS 22 came out and it broke our app that we wrote for iOS 6. Hmm, what are we going to do now? Uh, my question is around, uh, you know, everything that you've talked so far has been from the development side of things. And so you got the app out, now it's being used. What sort of complexities and challenges, if any, does it raise in terms of, you know, instrumentation, data analytics, data gathering side of things? So, you know, the non-user facing side of things, stuff that, you know, product managers and business side of things looks at. So what, what, what kind of complexities and challenges has that raised? Well, if you understand Google Analytics, you can instrument uh, basically any of these apps the same way you would instrument a web page and have it feed right into a standard Google Analytics dashboard. That said, Google Analytics can be very difficult to understand at times, and so there are alternatives uh, like Flurry, and I think Crashlytics is now getting into this as well. Um, there are, I think, are quite a few other competitors in the analytics space. Um. So we definitely have tried several uh, vendors as far as um, you know reporting suites, and um, some of the decisions were very conscious. From you know, we wanted sort of a second source of truth on if the data points we were getting were actually accurate. So we actually instrumented with two different providers sometimes, um, as well as our own sort of home world. So um, you know, I think. Uh, a challenge for us is really, um, if you ask, you know, the non, you know, the people in the back office, sort of, of the company, you know, what kind of reporting do you want? They say everything, but everything costs 25% of our engineering manpower on an app release, and so that's probably a bad decision, um, you know. And then turning around that data and showing it in some meaningful way requires a certain amount of expertise, and often the people who put it in there have to be leveraged, and so now your engineers aren't always programming. So um, I don't think it's a, it's a simple matter to get some analytics. I think it's a, you know, you have to be careful that you, um, 
choose the right things to instrument um, and uh, invest in it appropriately. You know, I think we've kind of, as a company, swung from one end of the spectrum to the other and are sort of now swinging back, you know, but it's a little bit of a learning journey for us in that regard. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, you mentioned Crashlytics. Like, Crashlytics is the bomb. It is so great. Like, um, and not just, it does crash reporting, but you're right, they're getting more into their answers products. We also use Google Analytics, so, and we have had problems with bad data, essentially, in terms of our sampling rate being wrong, but fundamentally, it, 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 Google Analytics, it feeds right into the dashboard. It works the same, you know, pretty much the same as, as Web Analytics. So, from that perspective, it's pretty equivalent. We have our own in-house uh, tools that we use to log information, and so we're able to use those same tools. It's not any different in, uh, in the web versus the app. So again, we're, we're just we're leveraging all the tools and the reporting that we have, and we're able to reuse that for everything. So yeah, ours, ours is pretty simple and straightforward. Although I was interested because we had talked about uh, cr crashes and bugs and QA earlier. You know, it's really hard for us. You know, we've we've got a relatively simple app. But bugs still get through, and you know we, we've we've tried Flurry to try to get some some data, but um, QAing the do, doing QA is is hard, and figuring out what bugs users are experiencing out in the wild is it just seems baffling. You know, I, I read reviews, and they're like, "Oh, this thing is crashing," and I open it up, and I did this thing, and it crashes, and people are complaining, and it's real hard to to reproduce the scenarios that that your users are describing, like. It is, are you using Flurry or you're using Crashlytics? Is that helping you guys uh, find these bugs and, and squash them? Yeah, at, uh, at Evernote, we're using, um, let's see, we're using Hockey App, I think, uh, for some of our stuff. And I think we're trying out Crashlytics on other stuff. And uh, they're both really great tools for finding bugs. I, I have a personal project that uses uh, Crashlytics. And man, if you want to see like an, kind of an incredible like experience, like installing like a library or framework in, in a product, holy moly. And you should see how slick this thing is they have. It's it's pretty cool. Um, and the reports are also very slick and, and nice. And you just, it's kind of an experience. It's pretty cool. You're like, oh yeah, awesome, a crash. Now I can go use Crashlytics. <laughs> Let's see what cool new UI thing they've done on, on their website today. It's, it's, it's kind of cool. To that Crashlytics, to that specific question, what I really like now is that in Crashlytics, it has this metric of percent user crash, percent users that have a crash-free experience, and percent users that have a uh, percent of sessions that have a crash-free experience. So, you know, we're really we want that you know 99.9 plus, and it it orders or crashers by the number of users that are impacted. So it's really easy. You just plop, you know, open it up, and you're like, boom, boom, boom. Those are our our crashers that are the most people are experiencing. So, it's in term and to that point, uh, the install process is just like. You know, one line basically. It's 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 a great product. I'm I'm really impressed with it. I'm wondering about uh, Java performance in Android. I guess it's pretty good. But is there any case for using C++? I believe that's called NDK as opposed to SDK in Android. Is that worth doing, or do you lose features, or you just never even bother to think about that? Oh man, Android questions. Okay, so keep in mind that I'm an, mostly an iOS developer. Um, we do use NDK for some stuff because, uh, like you said, there can be some issues, especially when using large amounts of memory uh, with with, uh, with Java. Although it's not the language is Java, but the the runtime is actually different. And I think they just introduced a new faster runtime. The original one is called Dalvik, and I don't remember the name of the new one. Art, art. Yeah, that sounds right. Art. Um, and I don't remember what that stands for, but. Um, Yes, there are de definitely some reasons to use it. the NDK. I don't, I don't think you something you want to be using all the time, uh, and you know it's kind of like a dark art, as I understand it, of like doing game development in Java and stuff. And you hear about all these tricks where they like basically uh, allocate all this this memory in order to cause the uh, garbage collection to be triggered and all this stuff, so that you know they can get as much memory as possible for the game. And um, it's kind of nuts, but. I haven't heard of anybody doing like going 100% uh, NDK unless they're doing like something like a game. Uh, but you should probably talk to somebody who has a lot more Android experience than I, than I do, and there are definitely some of them wandering around because I've seen them. 
along those lines, we don't do anything, but I was reading a pretty interesting article in terms of sharing logic between iOS and Android that they actually, some of their, their logic components they wrote in C++ and pulled into both iOS and Android. So if you're really brave and you want to you know, write native C++ for iOS and Android, it, it can be done. Yo, I went over some of the metrics. And earlier you were talking about crashing. That's not a good one. Uh, what are some other metrics that you track besides the core ones? And what insights have you found with your reports? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> so crashes are very important. Um, we, let's see, we track basically every uh, screen, every, every view controller uh, that people visit in our app. And basically that's how we can measure like, the feature usage on, on the app. Uh, I, if I recall correctly, in Sketch, we're measuring basically which tools people were using, so we kind of get an idea of, uh, of you know, what what people actually found more useful inside the app. And uh, you know, I, I seem to remember that we've learned some very interesting thing about like people use. Uh, I think it's based on location. Actually, I remember somebody saying in the Middle East, like people use like just the ink a lot inside of Sketch, because apparently it's like a really convenient way to like actually uh, like draw text, I guess, in Arabic. So it's kind of interesting. Apparently, we have lots of users there. Uh, so that's just some examples I've heard of. I don't, you know, it's not my my area of expertise inside of Evernote for sure. Um, we, I mean, we try to track. Uh, we probably track too much um, inside the app, but I mean, we really try to track every place that a user goes, how long they stay there, you know, what they engage with, what they don't engage with. If we signal them on something, if they respond to it, you know. So from the you know, application standpoint, we really are trying to understand how our users are, um, you know, interacting with the product. Um, and, um, you know, maybe even getting more sophisticated and, you know, trying out different things um, within the app is something we're looking at. So, um, you know, I think it's definitely very important, especially when your product starts getting more mature. Um, on the sort of back end side, we measure um, sort of every interaction the app has with our servers for purposes of, you know, response times, um, you know, if the content was served within our SLAs, um, you know, did we see like crazy data coming across, um, you know, how, how many requests we're getting for the different, um, you know, kinds of calls, those, those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's very important, and you know, any you know mature you know product should you know really ha be having a lot of both application level um, you know signals and analytics inside of it, as well as you know what's going on on the server. Uh, one thing that we recently added to our apps was Lean Plum for A/B testing uh, for the on the native side of things, and we've only done I think we've only just done one. So, but that's something that I'm really excited about being able because from a product engineering design perspective to see how those changes really make a difference uh, to user behavior. Because we have the standard kind of uh, conversion metrics and all the same, the same metrics you would have on a website, for example, um, that are just part of our business. But from a product and engineering perspective, the A-B testing is something I'm, I'm really looking forward to us doing a lot more A-B tests on our native platforms. So again, we, we, we do a lot of logging. We log everything. We log our users using the app and what we show them and what they clicked on and things. Um, so we had mentioned earlier that um, job seekers who use the app are much more engaged than job seekers uh, who just bounce in from web. And that, that makes a lot of sense, right? They, they made a conscious decision to go to the app store. They're going to install it. They didn't just follow some link and land on the page. So uh, it's, it's reasonable to assume that um, they're, they're more engaged and, and our data back set up. Um, one interesting thing that I found just recently, because we're going through some email thread, and we were talking about uh, the size of the HTML that we push down, right? So we, we measure that on both a desktop web and for our mobile applications, how much, it, what's the size of the HTML that we're pushing down to the client? And we were, we were looking at some graphs and seeing how it's, it's changed over time. And, and I noticed that um, our, the, the HTML that we push down to our our mobile clients is half as big as the HTML that we're pushing down to the desktop clients, um, which is great because we obviously want that to be very small because you know network latency and all that kind of stuff and it's a small device. Uh, but what's interesting about that too is we show them twice as many results. So we're showing 
job seekers twice as many results and doing it with half as much file size. Again, this isn't including all the other CSS and all that, but, but it is really good, you know, um, I, I think like a, taking a responsive approach is, is better than not doing anything in a lot of cases, but um, sometimes just putting a responsive layer on top of whatever you're doing on desktop doesn't lead to great performance. Again, we've, we've made a conscious decision that we're going to serve out a specific UI just for our mobile users. Um, we do that for performance reasons, and, and I think that's, that's paid off. When I was looking at this graph, I was like, oh, I'm glad we didn't do responsive stuff, because look how fast it is. Um, and, I, and I think it also uh, works out really well product-wise, because it gives you this opportunity to, to really look at what you're doing on desktop and saying, what's valuable out of here? What, what are the, what's the most important thing that I can do? What's the second most important thing? And it gives you a context to kind of you know, e even make your desktop site better by removing features that just really aren't needed or, or really aren't effective anymore. So. Yeah, if you want to get really deep into this, uh, I highly recommend that you look uh, into talks and uh, blog posts by Patrick McKenzie, who's probably one of the kings of like A-B testing and analytics stuff uh, out there. Um, but one of the things you do have to be careful of when you do this, uh, be cautious of, is you'll see stuff like, oh, very few people are using this feature. Let's take it out of, of our app. And then, well, it turns out that it's all your power users who are very vocal and have lots of followers who are using that feature and they're very angry with you all of a sudden and, uh, or you get lots of negative reviews because it was key to somebody's workflow or whatever. And the other thing is too that you want to be um, very clear if you're using analytics and your privacy policy and kind of depending on your business and your marketing about how, how you're collecting this data and what data you're using. Uh, it's critical to Evernote's business that people understand that they own their data and we're not going to mine their data or sell their data that they're putting into Evernote. Our, you know, our analytics are basically aggregated and they're, you know, it's this very high level stuff about what screens people are viewing. It's not at all about their content. Um, and like, you know, when we do like figure out that, oh, this is why, you know, they're using this tool, you know, in the Middle East or whatever, it's because we'll see people tweeting stuff out or <laughs> we have people tell us that. Uh, we hear lots of stories about how people use it, um, especially when we delete their feature and then we learn, oh, that's, that's what they're doing with that. Okay, cool, we'll put that back. <laughs> We promise really soon. <laughs> uh, sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. We've gone a, a little bit over here, but um, I know at least some of us, I'll definitely be here, Chris will be here. If, um, if you have other questions, feel free to come on up. Uh, this was obviously, um, we really appreciate all you guys coming out. Thank you once again to all of you guys. If uh, everyone could just give a quick round of applause for the panelists here.